Okay, welcome to part two of Ask Ron, where I take questions from the MD No Bull Forum. If you're not on the MD No Bull Forum, head over there now and join. It's free. All kinds of cool stuff going on over there, discussions, videos, everything. So I'm going to start with some questions. Uh, first one comes from an MD Forum member named Tell Them. He says, how electric was the gym atmosphere when training at Golds and Worlds Gym in California? Was it intimidating, motivating, or did you find yourself not getting much done from being so starstruck at the time? Was it all it was made out to be? It was all it was made out to be, and I feel very, very fortunate to have been out there at a time when it still was that way. Uh, you know, nowadays with the internet and social media, no bodybuilder has to be in any one location. You don't have to be in LA or anywhere. Back then, you had to go to LA. That's where all the photographers were, it's where most of the magazines were. So everyone would either was either living out there, the top bodybuilders, year-round, or they would spend parts of the year there, especially right before or after major competitions so they could get photo shoots, videos, all kinds of things. So I got out there in January 1991. I was doing my last semester at Emerson College in Boston, but they had something called an LA program where you got an internship in your related to your major. I was a mass communications major. So I interned at a company called American Sports Network that produced the ESPN American Muscle Show. Anyway, I lived a good uh, 45 minutes away from Venice at the time, but that didn't matter to me. I had to get out there and train there pretty much every day. So I went, joined Venice, and when I did go there, it was everything it was cracked up to be. It was like walking into a magazine. And bear in mind, there was no internet again, so I had never seen these people except in pictures in a magazine. I had never seen them moving. I certainly never saw them up close in real life. It was mind-blowing, the, uh, the physiques. And these were all the stars, Mike Quinn, Jim Quinn, Gary Stridham, uh, Mike Christian, you know, it was all the major stars, Barry DeMay. If they didn't live there, like I said, then they, they would at least come out there and you would see people visiting from other parts of the USA or other parts of the world. Uh, my brother, my son-in-law, go ahead, it's fine. Um, so it was both intimidating and motivating, you know, it was so motivating to see these people and, you know, I. I knew I was never going to look like them, but just just having them around, it was it was it was a great experience. And yeah, it was a little intimidating. Did I find myself not getting much done? Uh, more so, it was tougher because there was so much equipment at Gold's Gym, Venice in particular. Uh, they had three made huge rooms. Like the third room now is mostly cardio. Back then, it was all it was almost all equipment. In this place, it was like a, a showroom where new companies, anytime any company like Flex or Hammer Strength would come out with a new line, they would send every piece to Gold's Venice and say, here you guys, put it out on your gym floor, because they knew there were so many photo shoots and videos and everything going on all the time, they would get the advertising for their machines. So everything, if you wanted a leg press, there was you know, 20 different leg presses to choose from. So yeah, I would walk around, it would take me two, three hours to hit a body part, just because I thought, oh, that looks cool, that looks cool. I'd walk around and around, oh, what about that? And, yeah, it would take a long time. Uh, World Gym was a very, very different type of gym. Uh, so Gold's was very crowded, very noisy. It was a younger crowd. There was a lot of top stars. They played the music really loud. There was always people yelling across the gym. It was just like a circus. Uh, World Gym was only three or four blocks away, uh, but it was very, very quiet. It looked kind of like a cathedral. It had these very high ceilings with skylights and wood beams. Uh, so this is where Joe Gold, who started both Joe, the Gold and World's gyms, you know, that was his flagship gym, and him and his buddies used to hang out there behind the desk and bullshit all day long. And uh, you weren't allowed to drop weights. If you drop weights, Joe would kick you out of the gym for good. No music was ever allowed. Uh, he just didn't believe in music. He thought, you know, you should be able to concentrate on what you're doing. And, uh, you know, uh, over the years, I ended up training there more after video shoots that we would do. And the reason... We actually preferred to do our video shoots at World Gym in Venice for the American Muscle Show was because there was no, no music going. You know, if you're shooting video, you know that you don't want a lot of loud noise in the background because it's hard to pick up noise from the person you're trying to film. So if somebody's talking, if music's blasting, you can't really hear them. And, you know, I would ask the people at Gold's Venice to turn down the music. They would turn it down a little. It was never, they would never turn it off. But that was never an issue uh, World also had an outdoor deck to work out. It was really cool. You know, they had all the dumbbells. I don't think they had a bench, but they had all the dumbbells and some benches, a bunch of machines, cables, and it was all there. You could. The ocean was about a block and a half away. 
and it was uh, something different that, that Gold's Gym didn't have. Gold's was all indoors. They have an outdoor area now. Back then, they did not. Next question from Sand Pig. Sand Pig says, got any T. Michael clothing left from the 80s? Uh, I didn't buy it till the 90s, but maybe a Hot Skins singlet. I don't have any T. Michael clothing left. T. Michael, for those of you who don't know, they made these enormous sweatshirts with tapered waists. So any little dweeb like me could look like he was enormous by putting these things on. And I had a few. I had a hot pink one. I had one gray. I had one that was every color of the rainbow. They were ridiculous looking back at them now. But, man, I loved them at the time because I could pretend I was huge. I don't have any. You know, they got lost. I've moved a few times since then. Every time I've moved, my wife has thrown away more stuff, especially if it's been out of style for many years, and that stuff has been. I think the last things I was able to hold on to were, you know, the, lycra, the striped lycra shorts, and even those got tossed out a few years ago. Those are all gone. Big Mike Cox said, asks, was Flex Wheeler cocky when you shot him for American Muscle? Uh, the first time I shot him, uh, he definitely was. He'd already been on the show a couple times before I came along. Uh, Lou Zwick, the guy who produced the show, he was a tremendous talent scout, so to say. He discovered so many people, so many people in the 80s and 90s, long before anyone else did. Flex was one of them. And he had Flex on the show f f several times before I came along in early 91. So... Uh, around May of 91, it was about a month out, six weeks out from the USA Championships. Flex was a heavy favorite to win. Uh, there was a dark horse, this guy from Boston named Mike Matarazzo, that was also looking really good. So Lou decided to have them co-host and sort of like, you know, like a friendly rivalry thing where they're giving each other crap while they were introducing segments of the show. So I knew Mike a little bit because I had already been on one video shoot with Mike, maybe two at, at that point. And uh, he's from Boston, I'm from Boston, so... We knew a lot of the same places. We knew a few people in common. So I was comfortable with Mike. Flex came across as really cocky, arrogant. Uh, and the one thing that really pissed me off that day was, for some reason, I didn't know the term skull crushers at the time. Don't ask me why. And he was, instead of saying, you never hurt, you don't, you don't know what that means, he said, don't you lift weights? And, you know, compared to him, it didn't look like I lifted weights. So I was deeply offended. Uh, as time went by, I shot him many more times, got to know him. Turns out that cockiness and that arrogance was a front. Uh, it was to cover up his, his insecurities. He wasn't a bad guy, and he's a very different guy now. He's mellowed out so much. Curdy 1999 asks, uh, famous, most famous, prestigious person you had dinner with? I really haven't had dinner with many prestigious people at all. I had lunch twice with Bolo Young, who you might know from the movie Bloodsport with Jean-Claude Van Damme. And, of course, Enter the Dragon when he was much younger, Bolo was looking to uh, make a couple movies of his own. And I worked with Robin Chang for a few years. Robin had the cubicle next to me. Robin knew Bolo somehow. So he was the translator. Uh, nothing ever came of it. You know, I wrote six screenplays. None of them ever got produced. Uh, apparently, I wasn't that great of a screenwriter. Huh? So, yeah, my daughter's like, what? Huh? No, really, I wasn't. But, uh, yeah, he was a cool guy. He didn't speak a lick of English. Uh, next question. How much weight did you gain on your first cycle? Okay, this is a really good question. And you know, I'll, I'll be honest with it. So this was like uh, late 96 going to early 97. So we're talking now over 20 years ago. Yeah, it's been a while. So I lived in LA. People would go down to Mexico to get stuff if they didn't have a hookup. And I, I really didn't have a hookup. So I went down to Tijuana. And uh, Organon made these... There was a lot of fake crap down in Tijuana. Even though it was Mexico, they still... They're very shysty, very shady down there. So the pharmacies would be packed with a lot of fake shit that stupid American kids would go in and buy. But a lot of stuff was real, but you had to know it was real. So uh, Organon, the pharmaceutical company, made these Sustanon, which you're familiar with as a test blend. They made it in these uh, uh, these little kits the, that you had to assemble, basically. You know, it was like you had to screw three pieces together. They called them ready jacks. And I was so dumb, I didn't even realize that you could I could have changed the needle to a smaller needle. Uh, but instead they came with these like harpoons. They were 18 gauge, which were huge needles. They left a, a hole in you, a gaping hole wherever you injected. So I would do, I did two of those a week and I did, uh, I think it was like 400 milligrams of this veterinary DECA. You know, it was meant for horses. You could get the veterinary stuff down there in Mexico. It was cheaper and you knew it was real. The problem was it was low concentration. It was like 50 milligrams per milliliter. Whereas most DECA that you see would be 200 to 300 now mix per mil. So this you had to jam a lot of liquid, a lot of oil, which is not a concern with like a horse because a horse doesn't ask this big. So they don't, 
no one cares if you have to put this much oil on a horse's ass. But it was a lot of oil for my ass, so 400 milligrams of that was a lot. So, so it was 900 milligrams total. I did that for eight weeks. I put on about 20 pounds, 25 pounds. At least half of that was just water bloat, no doubt in my mind. Uh, I didn't, I didn't get so much bigger, although I did get bigger and fuller. And I would honestly say that's the best results I ever got from a cycle in my life. But I did get a lot stronger. I just definitely was geared more toward getting stronger than I was bigger because I remember my squat went from like 365 for a few reps to I was doing 495, five plates for 10, 12 reps. And that, that was just in the span of eight weeks. Um, another question. Would you rather look like Arnold in 1975 and be broke or be Genova smart? He's referring to Jason Genova and have $10 million. Uh, all the money in the world wouldn't be worth it if your brain is if your brain's damaged and you can't think and function right. So that's a stupid question. You know, if I looked, I'd rather look like Arnold or look like anybody and still have my brain and then just make money than than have all that money and my brain's never going to work correctly again. I'll never be able to function as a normal human being. A uh, couple more questions and I'll call it quits for today. Why is Sean Ray such a hater? He's not a hater. Uh, that's ridiculous. Sean is uh, a Hall of Fame bodybuilder. He has no reason to be jealous, especially of young guys coming up who haven't really accomplished that much in the sport yet. He's not jealous of, the, of these guys. He's not a hater. He's paid to be a critic. He's paid to give his educated opinion, his objective opinion on physiques. And a lot of times he gives constructive criticism. Maybe it comes across sounding harsh to the guys because, you know, everyone's on Instagram now and everyone's just being used to being told how awesome and perfect they are. You know, in bodybuilding, ver nobody's perfect, and everybody could stand to improve. And a lot of guys out there, especially the younger guys coming up, they have several things that could be better. And when they're better, they're gonna, their physiques are going to be more complete, and they're going to be closer to where they want to be. And if those who actually have listened to Sean over the years and made the improvements, they've gone up the ladder. And those guys who refuse to listen to criticism and think they have everyone around them just fawning over them and saying, you're the best, you're the best, you're an uncrowned Mr. Olympia, those guys never get any better, and they usually never really fulfill their potential because they don't make the improvements. So Sean is not a hater. Sean is a critic, which is what he's paid to be. That's his job. Uh, last question. I'll do one last question for today. I promise this will be it. Alberto asks, do you still have the passion to train after all those years? Do you have regrets about not pushing more to turn pro? Uh, I figured out long ago that I don't have the genetics to be a pro. That being said... With the Masters shows being what they are, there is a slight chance in hell that if I manage to get big enough and lean enough and hit a weak enough class at one of the Masters qualifiers, I could possibly get my pro card. That being said, would I be a good pro ever? No, there's no effing way. These guys are, they're another species almost. They're not, they're mutants. They're legitimately mutants, genetic freaks. You know, I would never look like that. And so for me to really push and do what I thought was necessary to try to be one of those guys. It would have been a waste of time, money, uh, compromise my health. You might hear my dog trying to throw up right there. Sorry about that. Uh, so what was the other one? Do I still have the passion to train? Yeah, let's end this on a high note. I absolutely do. I train three days on, one day off, all the time, and I love training. Uh, it's the first thing I want to do every day, and after that, I can move on and get work done and stuff. But I look forward to my workouts, even though I'll be 48 next month. I'm riddled with injuries. Progress is almost impossible to make at this stage, but I still keep pushing because I'm not in there just to be fit or stay in shape. I'm always trying to make improvements on things that I know. You know, my physique is very, very far from perfect. So I'm always trying to get a little better and train as hard as I can, stay injury-free, and uh, have a good time with it, have fun, because it's, it's something I've been doing consistently since I was 14 years old, never seen myself quitting, and it's a part of who I am, it's something I just love to do. So that's been it for second edition of Ask Ron.